Thank you. Thank you all for coming so early in the morning after the festivities last night. So, um, if I could have the first slide, thank you. So, hematopoietic, that's how we spell it. And um, hematopoietic means blood regenerate, it means the blood system, it means blood regeneration. So, a little background on the blood system before I, um, before I get into the details of my work. And what I thought I would do is give you an overview today of the kinds of work that we've been doing since I've been a faculty at, uh, member at Baylor for the last 13 years and give you three short vignettes of, of a little bit more detail about the kinds of experiments and the findings that we've had. So the hematopoietic system is comprised of your red blood cells and your platelets. The red blood cells are those critical cells that carry oxygen to all of your tissues, and the platelets are those that are involved and required for clotting. There's also about a dozen different types of white blood cells, and all of these cell types, th these white blood cells are those that comprise your immune system and are critical for fighting off all of the different kinds of infectious agents that we're exposed to absolutely every day. All of these blood cell types, they're circulating, they're doing all of these jobs, and their, their lifespans are relatively short, from a few hours to a couple of months. And so they're constantly being regenerated, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. In, in general, the, there are two classes of these cells, these so-called myeloid cells. Some of these uh, include the red blood cells and the lymphoid cells. And these are really two distinct arms of this blood system. And we've had this concept of these distinct arms of the blood system for about 150 years since aniline dyes were developed uh, in the 1850s and used to study different tissues. And it must have been quite fascinating to be one of the first to observe the bone marrow with this enormous diversity of blood cell types um, with all of these different staining patterns that, that one can see. And so these pathologists who were really developing the very, very early field of pathology uh, were looking at these and were able to, to infer um, the relationships between the cell types in the bone marrow through these staining patterns. So this is a monograph from one of these um, early studies that actually was published about 100 years ago. And this monograph was published uh, uh, in order to argue for some particular relationships. So there was a group um, characterized by von Neumann and Maximau who believed that all of the cells in the bone marrow and the blood were generated from a single cell type. They thought there was one cell, that they were, so they were called the Unitarians. And Paul Ehrlich uh, was the leader of another group called the Dualists, who believed that these two branches of the blood system were very distinct, regenerated from distinct components. Well, as we now know, uh, he who controls language controls concepts. And so in, in this argument 100 years ago, they coined this term stem cell, or stamzella, uh, in about, in about 1905. And this is one of the first uh, monographs that uses that term. Um, and that really allowed this concept to stick in the minds of, of all of these investigators, that there was a single cell that was responsible for generating the whole hematopoietic system. So now we are, 100 years later, really stuck with this concept, and this is our dogma. So we can, here again are our blood cells, and here is this, this single stem cell that generates all of these, and the idea is that it, that single cell has, the, has equal propensity to give rise to all of these different types. Part of our understanding now is that the stem cell has at least some capacity to regenerate itself, a process we call self renewal. And all of these cells reside in the bone marrow. That's where the major process of re blood regeneration occurs. And then these cells exit, the differentiated cells exit and go around in the blood where they do their jobs. So in addition to the stem cell, we also now understand that the stem cell is a very rare cell in the bone marrow, and it's really part of a dormant reserve of cells that uh, make up the, that regenerate the blood. And the real workhorses of the bone marrow are what we call progenitors. And they are somewhat specific for these, these different cell types. Once the stem cell decides to come out of its state of dormancy, it generates these progenitors, which become slightly more specialized with every cell division to make all of these component cell types. So I want to emphasize that the stem cell is extremely rare. This is what makes it very difficult to study. In the bone marrow, it's there at about 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000 cells. So it really is the proverbial needle in the haystack. And that has really inhibited the ability to study it um, for quite a long time. So what we are interested in my lab is understanding really that stem cell and how it makes a decision to either stay in that dormant state or to 
to wake up and become activated and regenerate the blood. So why do we care about this decision process? Because that's what we do every day, we think about in my lab. Well, it, is a, it addresses a fundamental biological question. How do you get from something that's essentially generic, undifferentiated, to something that has all of the specificity of, of these very, very specialized blood cells. And it's really a process that's recapitulated in the adult, in the adult bone marrow every day, in all of our bone marrow, that is the same sort of process that occurs during development of an organism from an egg to an embryo. So it's by understanding this process, we will have insight into basic development. We also think that it will help us do cell-based therapies ultimately, because if we can find ways to manipulate, modulate, and correct genetic diseases in the stem cell, then when those stem cells generate all of the downstream cells, that correction will be inherent in all of those. So you could theoretically treat sickle cell anemia or cells, uh, diseases of the, of the white blood cells, and so on and so forth, if we can find good ways to manipulate that stem cell, which we still don't have at this time. And we also hope that we'll have ultimately insights into cancer because cancer in the blood, there's many different types of leukemias, and they are characterized by inappropriate proliferation of some of these component cell types. So if we can understand the mechanisms through which a stem cell decides to proliferate or to stay dormant or to differentiate, we might have insights into what goes awry in cancer. So this is what we're studying in my lab. So how do we study it? Well, one of the things that we needed to do, because these stem cells are so rare and dormant, is to wake them up and, and get a whole group of these stem cells that are in the process of making this decision to, to proliferate and to differentiate. And we can do that by treating mice with a chemotherapeutic agent. 5-fluorouracil um, is actually used in the clinic chemotherapeutically, and most chemotherapeutics um, target rapidly dividing cells. So in the bone marrow, that's mostly those progenitor workhorses that I referred to and some of those differentiated cells. So if you treat mice or, in fact, people with a dose of this chemotherapy, it wipes out those dividing cells pretty quickly. Well, that wakes up all of these dormant stem cells. So when you treat mice with this dose of 5-FU or 5-fluorouracil, the bone marrow cell number drops precipitously and reaches the nadir about six days after that one treatment. And if you look at the stem cells over that same time course, they, they pretty much synchronously go into cycle so that they're uh, all cycling together between days three and day six. So we realized that we could use this process of synchronous decision making to study how they're making this decision. So we purified the stem cells at different time points over this time course, and then cracked them open and tried to identify a catalog of the changes that were occurring in the stem cells. Well, one of the ways that we can do that in the bone marrow is to simply look at all the genes that are being expressed at any given time. Well, there are roughly 30,000 genes in your genome, and now we have sophisticated technologies that we can look at many of these, most or almost all of them at once, um, using these microarray um, technologies. So this is just an example. Sorry, it's a bit dark, but I think it'll still illustrate the point. We, we have the different time points um, going across the slide horizontally and um, from day zero to day 30. And in the middle, uh, horizontally, is a representation of, of a single gene. So most of these genes are blue or black at day zero and day one, and then they go up and become highly expressed, and that's why they're yellow between days two and six, and then they go back down at, at days 10 to, to 30. This is a particular group of genes with this pattern of expression that's expressed at a low level and then a high level when the stem cells are dividing and then again at a low level. And we also have genes that have the opposite pattern of expression that are expressed at a low level when the cells are dividing. So we can look at this catalog of genes and then start to uh, uh, make hypotheses about what is occurring in the cells during this decision-making process. So one of the, the classes of genes, when you have these 30,000 genes, you can't really look at one at a time and, and make inferences about exactly what it's doing, but you can classify them and say, well, all of these types of genes are doing this and all of these types of genes are doing that, and that gives you a bird's eye view of what's happening when these cells are making a decision. So one of the classes of genes that was changing were, were called interferon-inducible genes. Well, that caught our eye because interferons are the first alarm in your body when a pathogen enters, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, the interferons are pretty much ubiquitously used 
to alert the immune system that there's an infection going on and to recruit these immune cells to the site of infection. So it was very interesting to us that these interferons, which were part of this immune system that nobody thinks about as necessarily directly connected to the stem cell, but it was having, these interferons seemed to be having an impact on the stem cell. So we hypothesized that that there was, um, that infection itself would directly um, activate those dormant stem cells and that that was via interferon and that it was directly interferons on the stem cells. It could be that the interferons were activating some downstream cell which was then activating the stem cell, but we hypothesized that it was a direct effect. So we tested this by establishing an infectious disease model in our lab, which was a big deal for us. We didn't do that before. Um, we used this bacteria called Mycobacterium avium, which is, a micro, which is a model for Mycobacterium tuberculosis, in part because it's a very slow-growing um, bacteria. If you infect mice with it um, uh, uh, intravenously, it will eventually be cleared, but it takes about two months, and if the mice are, are compromised in their immune system, they will succumb to infection. In fact, most people have been exposed to, to Mycobacterium avium as well, with no adverse consequences, for, usually. So we used this, we grew this um, Mycobacterium in the lab and used it to inoculate mice, and then we look at the blood and the bone marrow and we ask what's happening. And what we found is that despite a very fulminant infection of the, of the um, mice, that really you couldn't see much happening in the blood, and that was because this immune system is doing its job, but also maintaining incredibly well the normal uh, blood cell components that are required. And, and these are just measures of the different kinds of white blood cells um, in the blood during the course of infection. But we went into the bone marrow and looked at what was happening to the stem cell, and we could see that very quickly those cells were brought out of dormancy. So we, we could see that the dividing cells up t uh, took up this bromodeoxyuridine, which binds DNA, so when the cells are dividing, they have more of this um, dye. And so they were activated very clearly during the course of infection. We also showed that if you, um, that this inter, um, that genes required for responding to interferons were required in the stem cell for that uh, activation response. So here we see wild type mice infected with Mycobacterium avium and we see this increase in cell proliferation. But when we have mice in which this interferon system has been ablated, or we call them knockout mice, that response is absent. So you absolutely need this intact for it to work. So in summary, what this showed us was that not only were interferons activating the downstream components of the blood system, but they were critical for activating the stem cell. And that this really suggests that there's a much more coordinated immune response throughout the entire hematopoietic system than was previously appreciated. In retrospect, it's one of those things that seems intuitively obvious, but this is really something that had not been explored before, uh, and there was really no appreciation that the that especially in the case of a chronic infection, when you really need a sustained production of these kinds of immune cells, that you have to really bring the stem cells out of dormancy at the same time through these fundamental mechanisms, immune response mechanisms. So that brings me to my next vignette, which is uh, if we have so many stem cells, why do we age? We have all these stem cells in our bone marrow, but also in our skin and other systems. And so you would think that they would continuously replenish these tissues forever. So we wondered what was the character of the stem cells in the bone marrow. And we could test this by examining, by comparing the activity of stem cells from old mice and young mice. And we do this in a bone marrow transplant assay, and we actually compete the two types of stem cells in one mice by mixing them, as I'm showing here. And we irradiate the recipient to ablate their own stem cells, and then they take over in the recipient, and then we can look at the blood of the recipient for the proportion of the blood that is made from the two different kinds of stem cells. So when we compared young stem cells versus old stem cells in this bone marrow transplant assay, we found that no matter how many different numbers of stem cells we put into the mice, as shown as we go across the slide, uh, the young stem cells were always better. They were about, they were almost double the activity of, of their old counterparts. So again, we used this gene expression technology to look globally at what is changing in the cells, what could account for this functional deficit that occurs in the stem cells. 
and I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but we found a lot of genes that increase with age and a lot of genes that decrease in the stem cells with age that are indicators of different processes. And I'm just showing a couple here. The, um, the stem cells had an increase in their response, again, to inflammation. So many of us think of aging as a bit of, a, bit of an inflammatory process, and that's clearly how the stem cells are responding to it, too. On the right panel, though, I'm showing what genes are going down with age, and these genes are involved in DNA repair, and that means correcting little defects that are occurring in the DNA over time. And so this is interesting because this is a critical part of the integrity of your genome, and so even the mechanisms that regulate that integrity there are, are decreasing with age. So it's sort of a double whammy. You have more insults with age, but you're also less able to repair them. Again, with all of these 30,000 genes that we were able to look at, we can do a lot of computational tricks. And one of the things that we did was looked at the timing of these changes in these large classes of genes as they were changing with time. And some of that is just shown here for the genes that go down with age. And mice live about two years, so two to three years. So we have from two months to 24 months. And the, the dark blue and black in the center is when the major changes in that category of genes is changing. And so what you can see again is that this chromatin remodeling, chromatin silencing and DNA repair is going down about midlife. So I figure that's what's happening to, to me right now. So um, this brings us to this concept, this, this model that we de developed that I call the slippery slope of, of dysregulation. Those, those chromatin remodelers, chromatin is the structure that the DNA is in. The chromatin is really like the um, the, the beams in the house that are keeping the roof on. And slowly with time, those themselves are disintegrating. And so that affects the overall integrity of the whole house. So you have environmental insults that affect the stem cell. That reduces the integrity of the chromatin. That leads to additional problems. Other genes that aren't supposed to be expressed become expressed. You have poorer DNA repair. You ultimately have decreased function in those stem cells. But again, that has made that whole house much more fragile and unstable. And so it makes it more of a fertile ground for additional aberrant events to come in and impact the system. So you can have other aberrant gene expression events, chromosomal rearrangements, and that ultimately increases the chance of, of malignancy development. And of course, cancer is primarily a disease of old age. So this is the model that we developed from looking at all of these changes in the stem cell, both the functional changes and these molecular changes that are occurring. Okay, and so that brings me to my final vignette, which is the question of uh, are all stem cells created equal? So I won't tell you about why we asked this question, but there were a number of experiments from our lab and others that led us to wonder whether all of the stem cells really did have the equal potency to generate all of the cells of the blood. So the only way to address this is to really look at single stem cells, and that's really not trivial for a number of reasons. Um, there are a number of tricks that we had to develop in order to do this, and um, I won't tell you the details about it now, but I'd be happy to explain to those of you who are interested later. But in essence, you take your single stem cells and you mix them with bone marrow from another mouse, and you sort these single cells into this plate, which then you extract them from to put them in the mouse. And for the engineers in the audience, I just have to tell you, this involves my favorite instrument, which is the flow cytometer. And this is an instrument that was developed on the, uh, on the technology related to inkjet printers that can separate cells at a rate of 30,000 cells per second and put them in a test tube, which then you can look at. And so when we're looking at cells that are there in the bone marrow at a, at, at a, at a rarity of one in 100,000, that speed and precision are absolutely critical. So it's a very cool instrument. So we could use this in order to separate these stem cells and ultimately put them into these plates and extract them from the plates and transplant them into mice. And then we ask if that single stem cell can regenerate all of those lineages of the blood that I told you about before. But that's not over yet. We have to then take the cells again from that mouse and transplant them into another set of recipients to show that it has that self-renewal property that it can still make more stem cells and more blood lineages and all of those other mice. So we um, looked at um, stem cell function in, in two areas, uh, two different um, uh, 
stem cells with slightly different characteristics that we had suspected had these slightly different properties. And we separated them using this flow cytometer on these different properties, and we examined their properties, their functional properties on this bone marrow transplant, like I told you. And in short, what we found is those stem cells from that lower region um, had slightly different properties in their ability to generate the different components of the blood. And so what I've done is here is color-coded the cells as they're regenerating. So the, um, the myeloid cells are, are the, the myeloid progeny here are colored in red, and the lymphoid progeny are the B cells and T cells. They're colored in, in blue and green. And if you just look at the red versus the green, those stem cells from the lower region had a much greater ability to generate these myeloid cells, whereas the stem cells from the upper region had a much greater ability to generate the T cells. Now, in almost every other respect, these stem cells are almost identical. They have these slightly different properties that we could see in their ability to absorb a dye that we use to separate them. But for every other marker that anybody has looked, there was really no way to distinguish these subtypes. So we could separate these functions but we also now had, a, had an ability to purify them and, and we're beginning to study uh, why they're different. So we see these differences in the blood of the, uh, the mice which have been transplanted the first time, but we also took some of these mice and we uh, took the bone marrow from them and transplanted them into a second round of mice to test whether they still had those properties in the, other, in the secondary transplants. And again, the cells from the lower region, the, the absorbed left, less dye, had more myeloid activity. There's more red um, cell production there, and these cells from the upper region had more ability to make T cells. So this behavior is very stable. It seems to be an inherent property of the stem cells when we take them out. It's not something that changes or evolves over time. So, to summarize what I've told you in this portion of the talk, we have now found that there are these distinct stem cell types with slightly different properties. These stem cells from this lower region, we call them lower hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs, are slightly more potent on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. They have a little bit more activity than those upper uh, HSCs. They're also more dormant, so they are less easy to be activated. Um, less of them are dividing at any given time. And they really do have this distinct lineage uh, preference. And I think of them as almost unionized in that they will do what they, they will do the other jobs if they really have to, but they're, they're paid to do the one job and they've been trained to do the one job, whether it's to make the myeloid cells or lymphoid cells, and that's really what they prefer to do and that they will do most of the time unless they're really, really pushed to do something else. So I return then to our original view of the hematopoietic system that we've held really for the, for the last 50 years or so, where there are these two main branches of the system, the lymphoid and the myeloid system, which are all regenerated from this single hematopoietic stem cell. Now we really have to see the stem cell as, instead of a single unit, um, as a consortium of stem cells with slightly different properties, some of which are better at making myeloid cells and some at lymphoid cells. And although I've painted a picture of two very, two very distinct cell types, we actually think that there's a continuum of properties of these stem cells in the bone marrow. And uh, it really, when we, when we came to this view, it, in, in our hematopoietic stem cell field, it really is re-revolutionizing the field because we've had this, this unitary view for the, at least the last 50 years and really the last 100 years if you think about the work that I told you in the very beginning. So it's really making us think about stem cells differently and um, whether the true definition of a stem cell really holds in, in the body, are there really these cells that can make all these cell types or really are they very specialized to begin with? And so that made me appreciate much more this early work of Paul Ehrlich, the champion of that dualist hypothesis. And he, is, he really inferred this idea of these two distinct parts of the hematopoietic system based on extremely careful observations that he made of the dye staining behavior in, in, the, in these bone marrow specimens that he was looking at under the microscope. And biology has become very much an experimental discipline, and that's very important, but I think that there's also no substitute for extremely careful observation, and it, it um, 
it makes me um, very proud to think that I'm standing on the shoulder of, of giants such as Paul Ehrlich, who made his contributions over 100 years ago today, and his, his ideas are still influential to us in the field. So with that, I will close and just thank the people in my lab who did the work and do the work all the time. Oops, so there's one more slide. Can you show the people in the, in the lab, um, just briefly. And this is really only the people who, are, who were in the lab in the summer when this picture was taken. And some of them have gone, and some of others have arrived. And, and there are many other people who've contributed to my work over the last 13 years who aren't in this picture. But I do want to give a, a tribute to these people who work very hard. And I'm fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to train and who stimulate me also with their great ideas all the time. And so thank you. Do you, have time for uh, do, you, do you think that there's any possible relationship between dormancy of stem cells and indolence in cancer? Dormancy and what in cancer? Indolence in cancer. You know, a number of cancers have this property of indolence. Oh, indolence. That's interesting. Um, indolence in cancer, this ability of some of them to go on at a low level for a long time. It's possible. I don't, um, I haven't thought of it exactly that way, but we do think there are some molecular mechanisms that regulate those promyeloid stem cells that are very related to some indolent cancers. So it's something we're thinking about. Is it, uh, is it preferable if one were to get a bone marrow transplant to get a transplant from a 20-year-old versus a 60-year-old? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I suppose you would probably argue to some extent yes. Although it, most of the time we don't have the luxury of choice. We're lucky to have a donor at all. And even the cells at, from a 60-year-old are amazingly good. So you could, from the mice, you could still transplant 100 mice from one donor. So you really have an excess of stem cells that can do their job for a very long period of time. I think only under extended periods of chronic stress or chronic infection would you really exhaust that capacity. So I think you'd still be okay. If you, know, if you had the choice, you know, if, if you didn't have a choice, you would have nothing to worry about by taking the donor who was 60 years old. This is a rather tangential question. The, the, the work you speak about sounds exceedingly basic. We keep hearing that it's very, very difficult to get basic research supported. Have you had trouble? Uh, does, I assume NIH is your main sponsor. Are they as open to basic research as, as we would hope? They are. They, they've had a long history of, of interest in basic research, and they are very, very supportive. I think, ironically, though, in the last five years, there's been a push at the NIH to become more translational, and, and those of us doing basic research have to make more of, more of an effort to justify our work, which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing to make us think about those things, but um, it, it, does, uh, it is somewhat worrying that if that trend goes to the extreme, then uh, there there may be more of a limitation on the funds for basic research. So it's, a, it's definitely a concern. Beautiful work, Peggy. Uh, but I'm wondering a question about how difficult is it go to go from the elegant work you do in mice to people? And I was particularly concerned, uh, intrigued by the chromatin remodeling seemed to go on a long time in your mice. Did I understand that to slide correctly? And do you think chromatin remodeling goes on that long in people? Well, um, amazingly, mice, aging in mice are a remarkably good model. Um, they, they age in two years in many, many of the same ways that we age in, in 70, 80 years. Um, they take on many of the same physical characteristics and everything, and so the whole process seems to be slower. We have not looked in, in human bone marrow samples for those exact changes, but there are other groups that, that are doing that, and they are finding some of the same things. So it's somehow that whole process is simply extended in time. Thank you. Again, lovely work. Is there any relationship between where on the slippery slope of aging you are and the differentiation of the stem cell 
in the myeloid and or lymphoid direction. That is, does aging of the cell, if you will, or the group of cells um, influence the extent to which they differentiate those various lines? Um, that's an excellent question. So, so there's really two parts. You asked if there's any indication where on the slope you are and really what the relationship is of these subtypes of stem cells to aging. So the answer to the second question is that there's a distinct relationship. So those pro-lymphoid cells tend to disappear with age, and you accumulate those pro-myeloid cells with age. And that's something that my lab is very actively studying right now. You also tend to get more myeloid leukemias with age. We think there's a direct relationship between the expansion of that myeloid population. And we don't really understand why one is expanding and the other one is. It's perhaps because they're more dormant and that they just last longer. The answer to the first question is, do you know where on the slope you are? We don't, but there are labs who are developing tests. There are a couple of genes which are, seem to be very, very good markers of where on the slope you are, and they are, are developing tests that they want to use clinically for that. And then it, to use the question about the bone marrow transplant, I mean, you could test your donor. Is it, even though it's from a 60-year-old, it might behave like 20-year-old marrow and so on. So those tests will be important. And, and could that imply that lymphoid cellular immunity declines with age? It absolutely does. It correlates very well. I mean, from well. that, Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.